Hello, my name is Michael Harbutt. I'm lucky enough to have been at the ADO meetings for a number of years. And I'm sorry I can't be here in person today, but I've had back surgery and I'm still recovering. My hope is that by next year, I'll be uh, dancing with all of you. That having been said, I want to recall briefly for a moment the memory of Steve Levin, who is one of our best friends and one of the best scientists that America has ever seen in the investigation of asbestos-related disease and other illnesses caused by toxic exposure. Steve, will miss you forever. I'd like to talk today briefly about the kinds of signs and symptoms that you may experience when you should be seeing someone with asbestos-related experience in the medical field, uh, which will help you give advice to patients or to potential patients that they need to be seen by a doctor who knows what he's doing. One of the major early signs that we look for in people with asbestos exposure is shortness of breath 15 to 25 years after the first exposure. Now we use that latency period, if you will, the 15 to 25 years, because the scarring caused by asbestos and the cancers caused by asbestos don't appear until that period of time has elapsed in most cases. Not in all cases, but in most cases. So the shortness of breath may be discovered at climbing one flight of stairs. One flight means from your basement to the first floor of your house. Climbing that distance will make you short of breath. Many people think, oh my gosh, I'm just getting old. I'm 50. Uh, take my word for it, 50's not old. Or I'm 55 or I'm 60. And everyone gets short of breath at this time in their life because they need to lose weight. They need to exercise more or it's something in the knees. That's not true. If you've been exposed to asbestos, you need to be evaluated for asbestos-related disease if you are becoming short of breath at virtually any time from your exposure, but most likely from 15 to 25 years. One is scarring of the lungs. Secondly is lung cancer. Thirdly is scarring of the cover and cancer of the abdomen. Fourth is scarring and cancer of the covering of the chest wall. This is called the mesothelial layer, and that's where the term mesothelioma comes from. One of the asbestos-related diseases that most people don't think of is colorectal cancer. You actually have two times the risk of getting colon cancer or rectum cancer with the history of exposure to asbestos. You say, how do you get it in your rectum? It's very, very straightforward from a medical perspective. You breathe in the asbestos fiber, your airway moves it toward the back of your throat, and you swallow it. And the asbestos fibers, which are needle projections, work their way into the abdominal wall and into the colon wall and into the rectal wall and do what they do, which is cause cancer. And in fact, all cancers have been associated with an increased risk of development in people with asbestos exposures. This means, for example, people with welding experience, who have worked in shipyards, who have worked in railways, people who are employed as plumbers in cement or asphalt work, or working as an auto truck or bus mechanic, well, in construction, or in mining, or in industrial environments, or in demolition work, well, if you're an insulation worker. Also, it's important to know that if you've been in the service, uh, your risk of running your risk of developing an asbestos-related disease is also higher. There are cases where ammo depots have been built from cement containing asbestos, and it's chipped off. So if you've been exposed to asbestos, the best thing to assume, until it's proven otherwise, is that you have a risk of developing asbestos-related diseases. Now, there is also what's called bystander exposure and environmental exposure. And these are also called secondary exposures, meaning that if you are an asbestos worker and you wear the clothing home that you wore to work during the day and say your wife washes the clothing and shakes it out, that releases asbestos fibers to the air. These fibers can be breathed in and cause the same sorts of asbestos-related diseases that asbestos causes if a patient is working directly with the fiber. We actually have cases in our clinic where we've seen children of asbestos miners, uh, taconite miners, which is contaminated with asbestos we now know, 
where we've seen adult children of taconite miners develop the kind of intractable, meaning uncontrollable pain that comes from asbestos-related scarring and asbestos-related thickening of the lungs. We, in fact, reported this in the medical literature uh, a few years ago, and it's, it's a significant problem. What sorts of things do you need to make, your, make sure your doctors know when you go to ta tell them about shortness of breath related to asbestos exposure? You need to tell them all of your medical history. It's all important. Secondly, if the doctor says you have asthma, that doesn't mean you don't have asbestos-related diseases. You have to rule out any kind of lung disease related to asbestos exposure. You need to give a history of your workplaces and the type of work you've done. You need to give a history of the kind of complaints that you're presently enduring. In other words, when you walk from the parking lot space to the shopping center, you get winded. It's not necessarily your heart. The heart needs to be ruled out as a problem in this sort of a situation. But you also need to rule out asbestos-related diseases. Give a history of where you've lived. We know that vermiculite in attic insulation is contaminated with asbestos in some cases. You shouldn't look without wearing the appropriate sort of protective equipment or having it done by a person who's trained in discovering asbestos-related uh, fibers in uh, environmental uh, places. For example, the attic of a home. Don't do it yourself. Make sure you have somebody do it who knows what they're doing. So what should you expect at a minimum in response to some of the things that you're telling the doctor? You should be put into a breathing machine like the one behind me. The simple blow into the tube three times is not enough. You should have a good and thorough physical examination looking for scarring of the lungs. You should have chest x-ray at an absolute minimum. And in most cases, you really need to have what's called a high resolution CAT scan. We used to say 64 slice high resolution CAT scans. And in fact, we've published some articles about this as being the gold standard. But now we have 128 slice CAT scans. And we have certain sorts of innovations that can be done to the 64 slice CAT scan that make it quite usable in asbestos related evaluations. You should be on the colonoscopy, as I mentioned, and you should have blood tests. These are important, important tests, and they need to be done by a person who is experienced and who knows how to apply different circumstances to your situation. One of the things I'd like to talk about before wrapping up this brief presentation today is a question that has to be answered that most doctors don't discuss with patients, and that's the following. What's going to happen when the present generation, and when I'm saying present generation, I mean those of us who are in our 50s and 60s, when the present generation of physicians and scientists who are interested in asbestos-related disease retire or become too elderly or too ill to work? This is an extremely important and vital question. We've moved, for example, in Michigan from being a place where there were at least a dozen physicians who were fairly well qualified to diagnose and treat asbestos-related disease to a situation where it's less than half that number. Nationally, the number continues to decline. Part of the reason for this is because it's very tough to be a physician who takes care of patients with asbestos-related diseases. Almost always, the doctor knows that the minute he tells someone they have asbestosis, which, of course, is sometimes and often a correct and appropriate and principled diagnosis, that there will be a process server at the door, that there will be depositions, that there will be all sorts of misery to make his life or her life as uncomfortable as possible. So we don't have the number of physicians going into this line of work that we had when Herb Selikoff carried the banner for physicians to be involved on a social basis and on a principled basis to help people who have asbestos-related related diseases. I think, frankly, one of the things that, Linda, you might want to consider doing at some point in the next year is, get, is calling together a conference of the physicians and, frankly, the lawyers uh, and union people and patients and advocacy folks who are involved in asbestos-related disease diagnosis and treatment and grapple with this issue. Because contrary to popular belief, uh, it's going to be a real problem in a very short period of time. 
And I think we need to have a very frank and uncomfortable discussion um, in, in the places where change can occur. So I'm sorry I'm not there with you. Look for me next year. We'll all go dancing together. And I want to tell Linda, you're doing a great job. Please keep it up. And I want to say to Steve, who I'm sure is listening in on us today, we'll always be with you, friend. Mm -hmm.